because of the anointing pump. And as always, we're going to give you all the glory for all the good that comes out of this service today. In Jesus' name, and everyone that agrees with that prayer, shout it. Come on, everyone that agrees with that prayer, shout it. Amen. High five someone, love on someone today, and then you can be seated. We want to welcome all of you uh, viewing us online this morning. Type of amen, good morning. Great to be online. We love you. Everybody, you all can follow along on our Linked Up Church app. If you haven't already downloaded it, you've been missing it. <laughs> Praise God. Otherwise, you can follow us on the YouVersion app. Good morning, honey. Good morning. All the notes are right there in one of those two places, the YouVersion Bible app or the Linked Up Church app. How's everyone doing this morning? <clears throat> that was okay. How's everyone doing this morning? Good, good. I want you to expect something great to happen to you this week. Not something average, not something normal. I want you to get your expectation up for something great to happen to you this week. I got one person that caught that. I, I, I really want you to get your expectation and your faith level up to a place where you expect God to do something great this week. And I want you to wake up every morning like this is the day that it's getting ready to manifest. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And I you. promise you, one of those days will be that day. Well, you know, babe, if we're really true to what faith is, which is now, faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the, sub the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of God. Come mm -hmm. on. Something good can happen today. It, it's already happening. God's moving pieces in place right now. He's dealing with the thoughts and the minds of people right now that's aligning themselves to bless you and to move out of your way. And you don't even know it, but God's been working on your behalf since day before yesterday. Yeah. And it can manifest today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead. And guess what? I don't even care that it's a Sunday, a non-business day. Yeah. The voice bell is being prepared today. The decision is being made today. That's just good. so that if nothing else, you can be notified tomorrow. That's good. So, so let's go ahead and line ourselves up with that. Come on, say it by faith. Say, Father God. Father God. I believe. I believe. Something good. Something good. Something great. Something great. Is happening for me. Is happening for me. Now. Now. Hallelujah. 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 Now, we'll wrap up today with facing you and facing God. Facing you and facing God. So we typically, all of us can agree, we start out all of our relationships. How I many know they all start off rosy? Ooh, Perfect. You so fine. Man, I just met the best person you I so could have ever met in my life. Oh, he listens to me. This is the one. He gets me. Man. Oh, I've my gosh. I've been believing for this my whole life. We were on life. the phone for three hours. And it seemed like three minutes. Yes. All right, so we all start off that way, right? We start off discovering, but once we discover the likes and the dislikes, then we begin to develop some other stuff. Because I mean, no one's perfect. So over time, they're going to show us something. So now, in order for us to get past that, we've got to understand love's sneaky culprits. So it's easy for us to fall into these traps because of the, in the internal condition of our hearts when we haven't mastered understanding love. Okay, and I just want to reiterate this today. The first love that you need to experience is God's love for you. I need a better amen in that. Listen very carefully. This is before you ever try to have a relationship with someone else. First experience God's love for yourself. Watch this. Then learn how to love yourself the way God loves you. So the next most important relationship you need to have is with yourself. You don't like being with you. Ah. Ah. If you can't be alone, oh, you know. You don't enjoy time with self. Yeah. Right? So I've got to master so I got to master God's love for me and that's the first and best relationship I can have. Then I got to have a great relationship with myself. I need to love me. 
then now I'm ready to show somebody else that love. Now I'm ready to love someone else. Listen to me, unmarried people. The challenge is people try to have relationships with each other without first knowing God's love for them. They've never truly been able to love themselves, so they don't have anything to give to someone else but fear and all the rest of the stuff that comes along with that. All right, so I just wanted to reiterate that today. That's the foundation of everything that we're talking about. Love's three antagonists, and I'm just going to go by this. And uh, from James chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, it says, But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, and that's really the key, it's in your heart. We're really getting upset with what other people do, but I think we need to be more concerned about why did we respond the way that we did to what they did. Because that's a condition, uh, that's an indication of what's going on in our heart. It says, so what's going on in your heart? Glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. That is a powerful blanket statement right there. Wherever envy and strife is, you're going to find confusion and every evil work. So if you find a lot of strife and envy and confusion in your relationships, don't start by trying to fix the other person. Figure out what's going on in your heart. I need a little better amen in that. And if you believe it's always somebody else, therein lies the problem. If it's never you, ooh, I, ooh, I need a little better amen. Come on, come on. This is the earlier group in here, right? And every situation always ends a certain way. Before you consider what's going on with the other person, consider what's going on inside of you. All right? So I won't elaborate on these, but number one, we talked about envy, and number two, we talked about strife, and that's all on last week's message. What was that quote? Which quote? That envy quote you had earlier this week. That was so good. Envy, I think the quote was, people oh, yeah. hate no, the real reason why people try to expose what's wrong with you is because, it's, uh, it's because they hate everything that's right about you. And therein lies envy. And we can be the same way towards other people, so we have to be careful that we're not so dispossessed or so, or so obsessed with what's going good with other people and ne not necessarily for ourselves, that we don't look for opportunities to expose what's wrong with them. And once we own that for ourselves, then we could own loving them beyond their hate and their envy for others. Because now, real love covers. See, if it's real love, I really don't want to expose you. I don't want people to know that about you. It's right. something else when I can't wait to tell everybody else about what's wrong with you. Right. And, you know, n n n let's not get it out of balance here because there is a time where injustice needs to be dealt with. There is a time, and, you know, a, a great quote that was said years and years and years ago was, evil prevails when good men do nothing. So there's a balance to that. But ultimately, in the body of Christ and the ones that we're in relationship with, we want to work hard on the front end to cover, to love. And sometimes love is dealing with the situation outside of that, all right? Just want to offer that balance. Number three, we're going to pick up where we left off on last week. You know, with the, with the onset of social media and, and mass exposure that's available to everybody, we have to be careful that we don't fall into these traps. And one of the things that many people fall into, I just caught somebody being upset about something that was posted, and it really rocked them. If you online, say, I will not be moved. I'm talking to people online. Type <laughs> in, I will not be moved by what I see online since you online. But even you, I don't be moved by what you see online. Sometimes some loved one or someone we know might uh, post a, a remark or something. And then some, some people might internalize and personalize and think it's about them. And next thing you know, we got a beef going on that no one knew existed. This is called offense. Number three, offense. Often simply means biblically entrapment, a snare, a stumbling block. Matthew 18, turn with me if you would there, Matthew chapter 18. I'll be reading from the King James, and it says in verse 7, 
This is Jesus talking, and he says, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom offenses cometh. In other words, Jesus is telling us that we should always take the high road and be diligent and even vigilant about not offending other people. And he says, woe to the, to the person by whom the offenses come. Let, you know, in, in, in times past, people would misinterpret that to mean woe to the person who took offense. There's something that's, God, Jesus says something about that too. But specifically here, he says, as believers, we should behave ourselves in a way in which we do not offend those that may be young, weak or non-believing in their faith. Amen. Remember what Paul says, if I'm with somebody and they're new in the faith and they don't eat meat and they're offended by eating meat, guess what I'm going to do? I'm not going to eat any meat. It's good. He says if someone is caught up in drinking and, 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 and is offended by, or no, actually it was a, a, a sacrifice, eating sacrifice, sacrificial food, he says I'm not going to eat the sacrificial food even though God has counted it good he says, I'm a new man, old things have passed away, but because I don't want to be a stumbling block to somebody else, right. let me err on the side of love being what they need for me to be in this moment. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Until you are invited with the opportunity to minister to them. That's good. Did you hear what I said? Until you're invited with the opportunity to minister to them. In other words, we're not walking preachers Amen. by what we say. We're walking preachers by how we live. And not everybody want to hear a word from you. And not everyone, everyone wants to receive correction and righteous rebuke. <laughs> Love says, I'm sensitive to who they are, and let me be invited and have permission yeah. to speak into their lives. We've been in ministry for 25, 20, now almost 30 years. And we still have to be sensitive to not walk up to people and just, they're wrong as all get out. But oftentimes it's not our place to deal with the wrong as well much as we love what's right. So with this offense, have here, offense is, the dual, is a dual responsibility. We have to be careful not to offend others with our words and behavior as well as not being one to take offense from others, especially for the cause of Christ. Luke chapter 7, verses 20 through 23. Most of us know this story, but now John the Baptist, who was the preacher that spoke of Jesus coming, he done got himself in trouble. And because he's gotten himself in trouble, he's in prison right now facing execution. And he sends his messages to Jesus, and, and, and he says, hey, I just, I, 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 I'm caught up in this jail, but here's my message. In verse 20 of Luke chapter 7, when the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, are you he that should come, or, or look we for another? In other words, now John is put off. I'm in jail. There ain't nobody doing nothing about it. So Jesus, Son of God, Redeemer, Messiah, are you the one, or should we look for another? Because the one that I preached about is supposed to come and save me right now. Isn't it funny how all, oftentimes we can just assign someone else our, the responsibility of redeeming and saving us instead of God. Anyway, in that same hour, he cured, this is Jesus, and in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Notice, they sent this message, but then it goes on to say, Jesus has kept on doing. He didn't even honor it, a, a response in that moment. He went ahead and he said, let me be about my father's business and keep doing what I'm in the earth to do. And then, he, then it says, Jesus answering said unto them, go your way. Tell John what things you've seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. You know, I have our best friend, he was uh, dealing with something some time ago, and, um, and, and I asked him, I said, well, you know, are you, are you concerned about what other people might think about your decision? And he was like, Patty, at the end of the day, either I'm righteous or I'm not, and I know I'm righteous. So we have to be careful. People make decisions off of this perceived offense because people didn't do what some, someone didn't do what they wanted them to do. Unmet expectations. 
unmet expectations or even work a lot of times it's not even expectations it's just that just I think things should be a certain way and because they're not I'm offended with you I remember one, here's an example. When I first started going to church, I was not churched. That's a good thing, I think. I did not grow up in church. I was not a drug baby. My parents didn't drag me to church every five days out the week. I know a lot of you are. And so when I started going to church, I'm me. I wore pants. Oh, I can't tell you how many times I was rebuked for wearing pants. And if I just wasn't so certain that I wanted to know more of God, I would have been so through with church at that time. I just thank God that I was already done with offense because I grew up offended. <laughs> I, I, was, I was bullied and teased to, to no end, so I was already past offense. But had I not been so chasing after God during that time, and even in my ignorance, it would have been very easy for those people to have. I mean, one Sunday I was talked to four times. And then at a home going, I was talked to twice. At a home going. And so it would have been easy for me to be offended. People have been offended because he speaks about how he honors me, and people accuse it of being fake. <laughs> she said, haters. Everything about this is real because I'm not good at fronting. Offense is the self-induced persecution and is self-induced persecution and affliction. It eventually turns to the poison of unforgiveness. When one is eager to have their way in a relationship, it's easy to manipulate, deflect, and target others with selfish ambition instead of trusting God through prayer and through love. And that's what happens in offense, that we so get caught up in, 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 in what we want and how we thought it should be in our thought process that we isolate ourselves and allow ourselves to, to, be, to be manipulative, to never accept responsibility for where it might have been erroneous on our end, deflect and target others out of our own selfishness and insecurity, where now everything that's wrong with me is everybody else's fault. And now I'm in unforgiveness, and now this is a poison that I carry with me, not just with the ones that offended me, but with everybody else that out, that's out there. All right, that's good. That's good. It's <laughs> my baby up here. You know, when I was looking at that Luke chapter 7, and I'm not going to go back to it, but, but it's interesting here that John did have an expectation that Jesus would come in. But at the end, Jesus said, blessed is the one that's not offended in me. And so I want you to think about this for a moment. Offense keeps God's blessings from flowing in your life. Mm -hmm. So I want you to think about who's offended you and kept you from receiving God's blessings. Because they're not worth that. Somebody ought to give a real good hallelujah. <clears throat> I said somebody ought to give a real good hallelujah. <clears throat> All right, now. Let's talk about this for a moment. We're going to go ahead and begin to wrap this up. So the destruction and the culprits of love can be summed up with one instrument, the mouth, the words that we speak. I know usually offense comes through the mouth, right? And when we get in close proximity with the people that we love, I mean, we know how to push all the right buttons. Don't look at me like that. I mean, we know what to say to get another person riled up, right? So it usually comes from words. James chapter 3, let's read that. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation, verses 1 through 10. It says, my dear brothers and sisters, don't be eager to become a teacher in the church since you know that we who teach are held to a higher standard of judgment. We all fail in many things, but especially with our words. Anybody in here ever failed with your words before? Anyone ever said something that, boy, you, you just wish you could get that back? Right? So we've all failed where our words are concerned. Yet if we're able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. And that means our character is mature and fully developed. So notice a 
fully developed, mature person that, that, that possesses character can control their mouth. All right, everybody get that? Now, it says here, and the same with mighty ships. Well, verse 3, horses have bits and bridles in their mouths so that they can control and guide the, their large body. And the same with mighty ships, though they are massive are driven by, and driven by fierce winds, yet they are steered by a tiny rudder at the direction of the person at the helm. So I need you all to understand the analogy that is using here. Your tongue is what's guiding your life. a small member but it's literally guiding your entire life scripture supports that right because death and life are where so we got to think about what we say before we say it and the tongue is a fire it can be compared to the sum total of wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body it corrupts the entire body and is a hellish flame it releases a fire that can burn throughout the course of human existence for every wild animal on earth, including birds, creeping reptiles, and creatures of the sea and land, have all been in overpowered and tamed by humans. But the tongue is not able to be tamed. It is a fickle, unrestrained evil that spews out words full of toxic poison. I want to just challenge you all. Anybody here ever thought you were over cussing? <laughs> Don't look at your neighbor. I'm asking you that question. And then a situation presented itself, and you went, excuse me, Lord, for a minute. Why is everybody looking at me like that? Anyone in here ever thought you were, going, you were finished with going off on other people? Until you went off on somebody, right? This is what I'm trying to tell you. You don't really know who you are until a situation presents itself. I, can I just tell on myself for a minute? Oh, boy. There's one person in my life, not her, that I just have to not really say anything to. You ever had one person in your life that you know if I just get in any kind of exchange with this one right here, this getting ready to go somewhere it doesn't need to go? and it's going to end up somewhere it doesn't need to be, then I'm going to end up going further than I want it to go, and then y'all might see me on the news tonight. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? It's really, it's an issue. I really want to help you all get this revelation. We use our tongues to praise God our Father and then turn around and curse a person who is made in his very image. Doesn't really make sense. So, so really we're cursing at God because mankind is made in his image and after his likeness. So out of the same mouth, we pour out words of praise one minute and curses the next. Hallelujah. I, I, I'm not saying anyone in this room, but people can cuss each other out on the way to church. And come right in here. Hallelujah. God is good. Get right back in the car and pick right up where they left off at. <laughs> Says, my brothers and sisters, this should never be. Somebody say, this, this. should never be. be. Alright, now this is not in your notes. I want to give you extra. I'll go through these very quickly. Look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, because it's not always what we say. Sometimes it's how we say it. Then it's not always how we say it. We said it in the wrong time. All right? Let's look at some verses that give us a little wisdom. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So you have to ask yourself, if what I said to them caused that kind of response, can I think about saying that differently the next time? We cannot take the posture, this is just who I am, deal with it. If it's not being effective with the people that we love. That's right. That's good. That's Proverbs good. chapter 15, verse 23, all in the same chapter says, A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. So knowing the proper moment and the proper time 
will bring sweetness to your relationships. And then for all unmarried and married couples in here, this is your verse today. Proverbs 15, 28 says, the heart of the righteous studies how to answer. That means when someone says something to you, you need to stop for a moment and think about that. And sometimes the best answer is to walk away. Oh, I'm preaching better than anybody saying amen right now. Because if you're like me, you can feel that rise from your big toe. You can feel that coming all the way up. Getting ready. I mean, just almost ready to fly out of your mouth, right? Sometimes wisdom will just say, you know what? Let me study about how I want to answer that. Let me pause, think about this. Let me walk away. Spend some time in prayer. And let the Father show me how I need to respond to this. Because if I bring me to this right now, it's on. nothing good is getting ready to come out of that. But the mouth of the wicked just pours forth evil. Just in other words, another translation says, just says the first thing that comes to their mind. All right. Now, there's another place in Proverbs, and I'm going to turn this right back over to you, babe. It says, even a fool is considered wise when they hold their peace. In fact, I got it right here, Proverbs 29, 11. Read it for me. And the passion. It used to be a meditation verse for me. Yeah, because uh-huh. you needed that. You- I'm gonna, let me kick her back to you. <laughs> she quick. She was quick, just like that, right there. She quick. But the Lord has brought her a long way. Yes, he has. Come I on, mean, thank my you. people thank out there just like keeping it real. You, you know, I was just one of those people. I was just like, I, I just got to keep it real. I want to make sure that there is no confusion as to what I'm thinking and where I am on a situation. Yeah, but sometimes that wasn't always the right thing to do. That's what I'm trying. That's what we're I, trying to help them with right now. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> and this, we grew out of this. But at the beginning. He got a lot man. to say. But listen to this. Even. <laughs> it says in Proverbs 29, 11, the passion, the, you can recognize fools. By the way, they give full vent to their rage and let their words fly. But the wise bite their tongue and hold back all they could say. See, that's real strength. See, a lot of times we could say a whole lot about a person in a situation. You ever been accused of hitting below the belt? You know, you you didn't have to bring that up. I was so guilty. I I mean, because I just wanted to, if I can't hit you, hit you, I'm about to hit you, hit you. That's blessed me hearing you say that. Just... (laughs) Just knowing that you have... Even a fool seems wise if they hold their peace. In other words... Sometimes we just need to hold our peace. All right, now let's move on. Now, if we truly believe God, then love should be the motive, the stimulus, and even the attitude in our trust that everything's going to be all right. If we seriously are singing, you are good, good, Mm. <laughs> then we should operate from this place of love that says, you know what? I don't care what you say, how you acting right now. I know I'm going to be all right. Amen. And this is not impossible or improbable if we commit to learning to love God. And oftentimes we get so caught, love him, and to love him is to trust him. And to trust him is to live life in the impossibles. To love him is to trust him, and to trust him is to live life in the impossibles. A lot of times we are staunch in where we are in life because we haven't believed God and, and, uh, to the point where we believe him and we, we, we are confident of his love in, for us in the impossibles. And now what we've, what we've learned, you know, facing love, we know what love is, facing me, how I receive and give love and interpret love, facing you, what I need to make sure that I don't get caught up in oh, those three sneaky culprits in relationships and in relating to you. Now we have to talk about facing God. Facing God. If you could throw up that image that I sent over. In facing God, we have to be so absorbed with who he is that uh, we don't misinterpret who he is based off of what we see. It's a rack of wine, but the sign says water. And the interpretation is that Jesus was here. Because he turned the water into wine. Keep the party going, Jesus. Keep that party going. 
It's important that we don't think that because bad things happen Amen. that God allowed it, that God permitted it, or that God even assigned it. Just because things look a certain way, even when they're good, doesn't always mean that it's good for us. And so how do you know that? You don't know that by your own experiences in interpreting God in it. You know that by knowing God. Because only he can define himself, and only he, can, the creator of love, can define love. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalms, chapter one, eight, Psalms 118. Psalms 118, verses 8 and 9. I want to read this to you while you're getting there. I wrote in my notes here, and it's not right there before. Well, now with what we've learned about love, ourselves, relating to others, and how does this all measure up to facing God. And the reality is the reflection of God that we're supposed to represent in the earth is in direct relationship to our love towards him and our confidence in his love towards us. All too often, we get more caught up in the ones that we're loving and how they are or are not acting that we think our acts of love are futile. Therefore, we give that individual control over our obedience and confidence in who God is especially when it comes to our spouses. Instead of knowing and understanding that there's a foundational love, a godly love first, and I got to love him as a Christian, because the reality is when we get to heaven, there is no marriage. And the merit upon which I am going to be judged is how well I loved him first as a Christian. So I can't get too caught up in what he is or is not doing. Now, there's conversations and there's, sometimes there's conflict, but I can't let that deter me from how God has identified me and downloaded love inside of me and the responsibility I have to love him and others. Yes. Psalms 118, stanzas 8 and 9 says, Lord, it is much better to trust in you to save me than to put my confidence in someone else. Yes, it is so much better to trust in the Lord to save me than to put my confidence in celebrities. I was like, wow, that's interesting. To put my confidence in celebrities, in other words, popular opinion. So we save the best for last because there's a reality out there that people are failing to rea uh, realize. There's a void that no one can fill but God. And our ultimate trust has to be in who he is. So I pose a lot of these in questions and facing God for a self-assessment. Do you trust God in your relationships or do you tend to assess and only deal with the person? Apart from God. Apart from God. So really what I hear you saying is there needs to be a freedom in a relationship that really it loves God and trusts God in spite of sometimes what might be going on between the two individuals. That's right, because he's never going to let... He's never going to let us down. All right, so this might, shock, this, this might shock you all to hear a pastor and a married person say this. But believe it or not, my life is not over if she chooses to not be in it. I believe God loves me so much, it will only get better. I'm not getting ready and to likewise. get depressed. Yeah, and likewise. All right? Both of us are this way. This is what makes this work. I'm not getting ready to get depressed. I'm not getting ready to stop coming to church. I'm not getting ready to stop praying. Come on, I'm not getting ready to stop giving. Come on, somebody. Matter of fact, I'm getting ready to turn all that up because I have absolute confidence in God's love towards me. Now, don't hear that the wrong way. I'm not going anywhere, and I know she's not going anywhere. What Amen. I'm demonstrating to you right now is that you have to get to a place in God where other people can't do something to you and, and you lose your relationship with God. Come on, I need a little bit better amen than that in here. Right? Something's really wrong with that because what you've done is you've given that person too much power in your life. Right. And believe it or not, if they have the power to make you sad, happy, depressed, mad, then they have become your God. That's true. That's true. And this is why people commit suicide, turn to drugs, and, and they say, I'm just going to do me. Is really doing you turn into sin? Is really doing you abusing yourself?
See, neither one of us would never do this, but if she, if she ever cheated on me, I'm not getting ready to go cheat on God. I'm not getting ready to say, because you did that, I'm getting ready to go do this. How many of y'all know that's who, that's her? Now, I'm sure I contributed to that in some kind of way, but the reality is that was a choice. Before anybody hurt that other person, they hurt God first. So before anybody cheated on their spouse, they cheated on God first. Before anybody did anything to anybody else, they did it to God first. Because the trickle effects of their abuse and their offense towards God started long before it showed up on your phone or in your <laughs> inbox or your... But anyway, number... I don't know why we're spending all this time. Really listen, unmarried people. Listen. I pray that you're listening. Unmarried people, are you listening? Yeah. Unmarried people, are you listening online? Say yes. We are so worried about what people are doing when they're not with us. Mm. when the reality is they are who they are. You will know you have the right one because the right one, when they're not with you, they're way more concerned about pleasing God than they are pleasing you. Uh, I hope that just went by somebody's head in here. But if you got to spend all your time, unmarried person, thinking about what somebody else is doing when they're not with you, that's a fear-based relationship. Nothing good can come out of that. Next one. How much time do you invest in God and your time with him versus your time in other social areas? The one I like to look at right away is just compare your quiet time with your social media time. And you'll learn a lot about where your love is. Look at your quiet, look at your relationship with other people and your quiet time with God. And you'll see a lot where your loyalty and your love lies. First John chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, the Passion Translation says, True love for God means obeying his commands. Now, of course, you can read that a couple of different ways. You can think that, you know, it, 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 because if, if you love God, you'll obey him. How many of you know that's not what he's saying here? Not what he's saying. He's saying here, when you truly love me, then obeying my commands is natural. Yep. Can you all see that? We're trying to obey his commands without first loving him. But when you truly love him, his commands are easy to obey. And then it says, and his commands don't weigh us down as heavy burdens. You see, every child of God overcomes the world, this world system, cosmos. For our faith is the victorious power that triumphs over the world. So who are the world conquerors defeating its power? Those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Number three, do you strive to obey your heavenly Father? And if so, do you count it hard? A lot of times people treat Christianity like it's just big burden. Like, it's, it's so hard. It's so hard to stop cussing. It's so hard to stop fornicating. It's so hard to stop lying. It's so hard to whatever the case may be. Why did he make me this way? Yeah, I can't help it. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15 says, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. It is because you haven't fully grown and embraced how much God loves you. And the securities, or better yet, the insecurities that you've enveloped yourself in in the world. I, I was that way where I just thought it was just so hard to start doing certain things. And it wasn't that it was so hard, but I just thought that, you know, being an aggressive person in corporate America was necessary in order to be successful. How many of you know that meant that I didn't trust what God said? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he'll exalt you in due season. How many of you know I, I thought that I had to go in there and be like, no, you got to do certain things, but no, that's not what it is. So if, if, if ever in life, just take an inventory and a self-assessment. Choosing to obey God isn't hard if we are confident and growing in the confidence of his love towards us and our love towards him. You know, Jesus said in Matthew, I think it's 11, 28 through 30, he said, come unto me all, all ye that, that are heavy laden, laden yep. and I'll Thank give you, you what? Rest. Rest. For then he my, told you why. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Right? So it's easy. It's light if you come to him. What are you consumed with in your thought life? What are you consumed with in your thought life? Unmarried person, are you consumed with getting married? That's not a good place to be. 
be consumed with God and what will happen is when you meet the right person you won't take it out of context because remember they still can't replace God in your life don't feel like when I get married I'll be complete you've got to believe that you're already complete in God all I'm getting married will do is show you how much incompletion you have yet to complete yeah, can we say it again love is blind but marriage is an eye opener there are a lot of people who thought they wanted to be married until they, until got, they got married. married. It's a lot of work. Any married people out here willing to say amen to that? I said, any married people out here willing to say amen to that? But remember, the work is easy and the burden is light if you do it in him. If it's hard, it's because you're going against him. So what are you consumed with? Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Passion translation says, stop imitating the ideas and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will for you or as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. That's good. That's good. Number five, are you defeating the world's power? Again, self-assessing. Are you defeating the world's power, the world's way of doing things, or are you finding yourself aligning and just being quiet and minding your own business? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God without faith. And faith works by love. Love. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. You don't know the Lord's voice if you haven't sought him. There's a lot of voices in the world. The enemy is a very good impersonator. Yep. And he'll come just close enough to the truth to dupe you if you don't know and have not diligently sought him. So if you haven't spent time in his word, the voices that you hear will lead you astray and you'll be so convinced it was God because it was audible. Because I felt like somebody was in the car with me. And the last time you spent time in the presence of God was Easter. And it's September. It probably wasn't God. Now, can God manifest himself? Yes, he can. But he, will, he also does not, not mind proving himself at the same time. So a self-assessment. Are you defeating the world's power? Are you operating in this place of faith where you're not moved by popular opinion or what everybody else is doing? Yeah, that's good. And that's what the last days are going to require. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Last one for today. Christians have been given power. How many of y'all believe you have ability? Have you ever said, man, relationships are hard? Just be honest. Raise your hand if you've ever just said that. You know what? Man, relationships are hard. I don't even know if I feel like dealing with all of that. Just raise your hand if you've ever said that. All right. And so remember, the earlier point about death and life are in the power of the tongue. So, so you've got to change the way you see that and know that you've been given ability to overcome that. Everybody clear? Right? Uh, I remember I asked a couple in the gym, you know, how long they had been married. And they said, 37 years. And then the wife piped up and said, he said 37 years. The wife piped up and said, too long. <laughs> so how many of you know one is in the marriage, one might be not in the marriage? Right? Because it's somewhere along the way, the perception of that changed. Right? I used to think, man, how can you be married to one person forever, for the rest of your life? Anybody else in here used to think like that? That was the reason why I didn't want to get married. I was like, one person for the rest of your life? But now after 22 years, I don't see how I could be with anybody else. Because I let God develop the love. Remember this, you cannot exhaust love. Love will grow as long as you keep growing. So when you see the relationship getting stale and going south, it's because people aren't continuing to develop in their love. You all receive that as true? All right, let's go with these final thoughts here. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now unto him 
who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. But hallelujah. watch this. Hallelujah. Everybody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can do abundantly above all that I ask or think. I mean, no, that's you. Do it, Lord. We, that's where we stop. Won't he right? do it? That's where we stop. Hallelujah. I mean, no, that's where we stop. That's like our confession, right? God can do exceedingly abundant. But, but how many know he can't do it without your cooperation? Let's read the rest of that verse. The rest of that verse goes on to say, according to the power. That word power, there is a Greek word dunamis. It means the miraculous power, force, and ability that's at work within you. And so it, it's on the inside, but how many know we got to put it to work? Right? We've got to put effort to it. We've got to grow. We have to develop. Back up to verse 16 and notice what he says, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit where at? So, so how can he strengthen you with his might in your inner man? Through what means? Prayer, time in the word, right? And so that's his goal. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts by what? That you being rooted and grounded in money. Love. Rooted and grounded in what? Love. So believe it or not, folks, the greatest benefit of his power working in you is that you be rooted and grounded in his love. See, we kind of read that this way. I'm believing God for $1,000, but I know he's going to do exceedingly abundantly above, and he's going to give me 5000 I mean, oh, five thousand dollars is not greater than you being rooted and grounded in His love. That's really the answer to everything, is that you become rooted and grounded in His love. That word "love" there is agape. So now we know it's talking about the God kind of love. And so the only way to be really rooted and grounded in His love, you gotta back up. You gotta be strengthened in your inner man. Christ must dwell in your heart and faith, then you're going to be rooted and grounded in the God kind of love, which is unconditional, which simply means regardless of what you do to me, I still love you. And I'm still confident and cemented in God's love towards me. So even if you want to fire me because, or if you want to do something to me or you think you're doing something to me, I know that God's got my back. Can you imagine that? Somebody saying to you, I don't want to be with you anymore. I'm done. And you say goodbye, but I still love you. I mean, that's a real freedom right there. I said, that's a real freedom right there. To, to say, they say, you know what? I'm, oh, it's over. I'm done. I'm married. Whatever it is. And you say, man, praise God. God is still good. God loves me. And I love myself. And I wish the best for you as you go. Okay, now let's marry that with something now. Let's marry that with something. God said, oh, no man, nothing but the love. But the context of this is talking about being cemented in his love. Being cemented in who he is in you and who you are in him. Because he says so that you're able to comprehend along with all saints was the breadth, length, depth, and the height. He's saying so that you can uh, comprehend just like John did when they couldn't kill him. Just like Paul did when, they kept, when, he, when, they kept, uh, when he supernaturally got saved over and over again, when the jail bars opened up and the shackles fell free. Just like Peter did when he was, uh, went back to fishing, but God loved him so much that he became aware of that love when he came back and to assure him that he became one of the most prosperous pastors in that, that time. With all saints that you'll comprehend and be so confident that there's no breadth, no length, no depth, nor a height. And to know the love of Christ was passage what you think, was passage all, passes all knowledge, which passes, that, which passes that degree, which passes that hookup, which passes that network and that association, those frat brothers and sorority sisters. To know the, to, to be so full of his love that it passes all knowledge that I can be full, filled with the fullness of who he is so that I don't fret in that business deal that looks like it might go south because I know I'm so confident in who he is. Either he got another one around the corner for me or he's blocking me from getting in further danger with this one. That's the only way love would see that. That's so good. 
The only abiding and manifested power of, Christ, of the Christian is confidence in God's love in us and for, and for us. And I'll wrap it up with here and Pastor Gregor take over. 1 John chapter 4, verses 18 through 19 in the Passion. It says here, this is the counter side of what that lack of the confidence in that type of love will bring. The Passion says, love never brings fear. For fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment is not reached love's perfection. Has not reached love. Has not reached love's perfection. Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated towards us. So, you know, when we all the time, oftentimes allocate this is the, this bad time, this hardship that I'm going through, this suffering that I keep enduring, this, this, this torment that I have in my mind, this worry that I have about my spouse, or whatever the case may be, is because of something I might have done. This is God bringing back. This is the, that harvest of that bad seed sown. If you repented, guess what? God done forgot about it. That's right. But when we live in this constant place of I'm dealing with this because of something that I did before, we have not received nor we've gotten the revelation of God's love towards us and his mercy, which he says is new every morning, and his grace that he says is sufficient all the time. That's so good. King James Version uses 1 John 4 this way. It says, develop love, the perfect love, cast out all fear. Right? Develop love, cast out all fear is the original Greek there. Develop love. I mean, you can have love, but it can be undeveloped. Yeah. Right? And so I'll close with this right here. How do you develop love? How do you develop love? Anyone, just throw something at me. How do you develop love? Communication, trust, time. All right, all those are good answers. Let me give you the real answers. Number one, study. Okay. Number two, practice. None of this is in your notes, so you need to write this down. You're not going to remember it. What's number one? What's number two? Right? Then number three is repeat steps one and two. Okay, what's number one? What's number two? All right, I want you to really listen to me. Every time you mess up in your communication or a relationship that you know should not go this way, how many know you need to go back and study a little bit more about it and then come back and practice what you studied to see if you've actually grown in it? Are you all listening? Don't just leave it the way it is. Say, you know what? I messed that up. That was not the right way to handle that. Let me go back and study a little bit more about love. Now let me go right back to the same person and practice what I learned, see if I can get a better response. It's the only way you're going to develop and continue to grow in that. I believe I didn't have the proper exchange with her yesterday morning. She was trying to communicate this, something to me, and I didn't respond the right way. How many know that's on me? Oh, he shut me down. Two words out of my mouth. I, did, I didn't need help. <laughs> I just thought you needed help based off of earlier. And so watch this. Maturity is able to acknowledge when it's done something wrong. Right? I'm telling you, and I'm telling you publicly, that was the wrong way to handle that. It was early in the morning. I just woke up, and she ready to talk. Right? My response, listen to me, 100% wrong. 100%. How I many know that's on me? I apologize to you for that. Now, if I'm really, truly, if I mean that, then I'm going to go study some more about this. Right? Then I'm going to practice it so the next time she wakes me up and talks to me in the morning, my response is going to be different than this yesterday morning. That's the only way I will know if I've grown in that. Because mastering love isn't done when everything is cool. Mastering love is not done when everything is fine. Mastering love is when it's sticky, when it's nasty, when it's offensive, when it's ugly, when it's emotional, when it's controversial. That's when we master love. It's not master when everything, that's disagreement. That's all that is. It's easy to love you when you're lovable. Mm -hmm. But boy, I need to develop my love when they're not lovable. 
to y'all out there. Yeah, this is a tough group this morning. Did you all get anything out of this? We're done for today. You all get anything? Let's all stand to our feet. Everyone stand to your feet. Man, love is, is the most powerful thing in the universe. It's not faith. It's love. And we do not love God until we are intentional about loving our brothers and our sisters. That's what facing God is all about. God's like, I can't hear what you're saying about me because of how you're treating my other child over Each here. Each other. All right, how many of y'all say you love God? All right, say I love myself. I love myself. Say I love God. I love God. I love myself. I love myself. Say I receive God's love. I receive God's love. I'll learn. I'll learn. To love myself. Love myself. The way God loves me. The way God loves me. And I'll learn. I'll learn. And develop. And develop. How to love other people. How to love other people. The way God loves me. The way God loves me. And the way I love myself. The way I love myself. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now let me quiz you. What is the best relationship of love that you can have in the earth? It's the one with God. That's the first one. What is the second best relationship you can have of love in the earth? the one with yourself. Listen to me, unmarried people. If you have not mastered those two, don't get in a relationship with somebody else. Are you listening? All and right. married people, if you're experiencing conflict, back up and master those two. And then come back together. And then you can resolve the conflict with one another. Praise God. I just feel like giving the devil a black eye right now. Can we just give God a real good hallelujah praise? Come on, I, I, I just feel like we've been knocking him out all morning long with just power shots. Glory to God. I like something Minister Benara said earlier. I believe we hit him in his ear eardrum. And now we just got him staggering and his equilibrium is off. Let's go ahead and give him the knockout blow. Go ahead and do this by faith. Boom. Go ahead and practice that right now. Just go ahead and practice that right now. Praise God. Man, I'm just full. Baby, I want to commit to you publicly. I'm not where I'm at. I know I'm not where I used to be. But I know I can grow. Ditto. And I'll work on that. Ditto. You need to say the same thing. Let's pray. So, Father, in the name of Jesus. We just thank you. It ain't time for the name of Jesus. You did all this, kid. I got it. I got it. Praise God. Everybody just look up here at me for a moment. If you're in this building,